Bona tarda. Benvinguts de nou en aquesta sessió de la Societat Catalana de Geografia. Avui tenim amb nosaltres el professor Gran Saf. Ell és el director del Departament de Global Studies i de Geografia de la Universitat de Hofstra, a Long Island, a Nova York. Va crear el programa de Global Studies i també ha participat activament en la creació d'altres programes a la mateixa Universitat de Hofstra University, el programa amb sostenibilitat i també el grau de GIS, de Geographic Information Systems. Ha estat membre executiu de l'American Association of Geographs, de la AAG i també el seu tresorer, i també ha estat vicepresident del Middle States Association of American Geographers, que aglutina, és una associació regional, i aglutina membres dels estats, entre altres, de Nova York, de Connecticut, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware i, per cert, també Puerto Rico. Ha participat activament com a avaluador, té experiència com a avaluador extern del programa de geografia, i sostenibilitat de diferents universitats als Estats Units i, per tant, és força coneixedor de la realitat de la geografia com a disciplina i també dels departaments de geografia als Estats Units. Per tant, hem aprofitat la seva visita per demanar-li que ens fes una xerrada avui sobre els reptes dels departaments de geografia en el context de la Covid i també en el context present. Per tant, sense més... Since uh, without further ado, now I turn to English, uh, I welcome you and thanks so much for your talk uh, this afternoon. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I want to begin by first uh, thanking Professor Kesselis for that very kind introduction. Uh, I would like to thank the Catalan Geography uh, Society for asking me to give this talk. Uh, it's a great honor, um, so thank you. Um, so to begin, let me say a few things. Uh, firstly, I apologize, I'm giving the talk in English. Uh, I'm, uh, so please uh, bear with me, all those who uh, don't speak English. Um, uh, and feel free to ask questions at the end in Catalan and, uh, or Spanish, and they can be translated uh, for me to answer. The second thing is, uh, I'm focusing on the United States, um, and I understand that it's the, the lessons and the, um, the illustrations that I'm drawing upon are not necessarily universal. So not everything from the United States carries over everywhere. So again, I apologize in advance in a sense if, if uh, this seems a bit parochial, but you will also find, I'm sure, many, many of the themes that I'm touching on are, are, um, are pressing themes for, for geography departments and universities globally, because we're all working, in a sense, under, I think, very similar pressures. Uh, the other point I want to make before I begin is that every university, in a sense, is, uh, like somebody said about families, we all dysfunctional in our own ways. So we all have our issues, but our issues are not necessarily the same. So a lot of the illustrations I'm going to draw on are obviously on... Um, on, on things that I've encountered either as a department chair, working in a department of geography, uh, through uh, various external reviews, uh, through various, you know, attending the AAG, being on, uh, at one point, the executive of the AAG. So I'm drawing on many, uh, on many themes, but at the same time, I, I think it's important to acknowledge that my experience as a department chair in a private university in New York is very, very different from being uh, a faculty member in a tier one research institution or a faculty member someone, somewhere else in a, in a community college, et cetera. So um, I'm hoping that the themes are universal, but, uh, um, but clearly I'm drawing on illustrations that I'm familiar with. Uh, so to begin, let's start with what the themes of the presentation are. Firstly, uh, I touch on the idea of neoliberalism and neoliberal globalization and how this has impacted uh, the academic landscape, particularly in terms of, of themes such as inequality, cost recovery and recruiting, um, and the pressures which we all face at, uh, at universities. The second is just in 
I'm not going to cover this in great deal, but the idea of how the liberal arts and sciences are increasingly under threat within a neoliberal environment. Uh, geography is an interesting um, discipline because, as we know, it, it sort of straddles or can straddle uh, the, the hard sciences and the liberal arts and sciences, and that's something I am going to touch on as well in the, um, in the presentation. And then the, the issues confronting geography enrollments and geography departments in the US, um, obviously I'll get to that later. And then lastly, uh, strategies that departments have embarked on to recruit, retain students, um, making some suggestions, and also discussing where, where I think the university systems are going. To begin with though, uh, I wanna just, this is really for people outside of the United States. I've discovered after giving this type of talk uh, many times in different, insta in different uh, international settings that th it's very difficult to get your head around the United States uh, university system. I mean, there's a system of nonprofit institutions, which is where most of us teach, but within the nonprofit institutions, we can break it down, if you like, into tier one research institutions. Those are the big public universities, such as Rutgers or Penn State, and then private schools as well, such as Stanford or MIT. Um, or Harvard, right? So those will be tier one nonprofits. Then you have the, and those could be private or, or state. Then you have the private institutions, but particularly the private selective institutions such as NYU, then the Ivy League institutions, again, such as Cornell or Harvard. Uh, what's interesting about the Ivy League institutions is that after the Second World War, they pretty much all eliminated their geography departments except for Dartmouth. So the only Ivy League institution that still has a, a geography department is Dartmouth, although uh, we've seen a growth of geospatial technologies and, and the use of GIS um, in programs at the other Ivy League institutions. And then we have just regular state schools uh, below the tier one institutions, and that is a very, very long continuum of, school, of schools. Um, and then the private schools such as where I teach which is uh, Hofstra University. And again, those are tiered anything below tier one. Often uh, the focus is on teaching rather than research or a combination of both. And again, you have this long continuum of schools. And the argument that I'm gonna kind of make in this, in this presentation is that the private schools, particularly the private schools below tier one, uh, geography departments are under enormous pressure um, for enrollments. And then, of course, you have the community colleges. Uh, sometimes these are free. These are run um, often on a county basis, normally two-year um, associate degrees. Um, and then we have the for-profit schools. And the for-profit schools, again, uh, are, you know, run the gamut from um, completely legitimate to less legitimate. You know, schools like, you know, Trump University would have been an example of a non-legitimate private school. Um, for-profit institution. And then, of course, you have the, the huge MOOCs, um, such as Coursera, which again are for-profit institutions. But even this distinction is kind of uh, um, difficult to make because they are partnerships between many non-profit institutions and uh, places like Coursera. Even in Barcelona, some of the state, some of the big universities team up uh, with Coursera. But in general terms, the United States geographic, sorry, the um, academic landscape is extremely diverse. So again, um, it's, it's kind of, you need to get your head around that. Um, now, if we start with the idea of unevenness and inequality. So what I'm basically arguing is that one of the fundamental uh, features of, of globalization has been inequality and unevenness. That's very different, obviously, from a Thomas Friedman type of idea of the world is flat. Um, pretty much, uh, I think, the hallmark of, of globalization has been unevenness and inequality, and that unevenness and inequality has now, has been playing out within the educational system, where the elite private schools, such as Stanford or Harvard or MIT, uh, are clearly thriving, and these are the places where I would argue um, which, which present networking opportunities for anyone uh, who aspires to get into, in a sense, the global elite. So in other words, just getting into these institutions opens up a world of, of in a sense, 
I'd like to say a privilege, but a world of opportunities for those who can get in. And I would also argue that, that globalization sense has, has globalized uh, brands and, and that as we see in all the different university ranking systems, the big brands in a sense have now become in, almost deterritorialized like Coca-Cola or Pepsi. Uh, so the big brands, Oxford or Cambridge or, or Harvard or Yale or MIT. And those big brands um, are really important because in a sense, not only can they capture, if you like, the global elite in terms of students, but also if those big brands at any time decide to uh, really move into marketing their courses for free, for example, on the internet or through MOOCs, uh, or even marketing them at, at a low cost, that can place a lot of, of, of pressure on schools like mine, for example, because it means uh, students now can, in a sense, get access to really, you know, to prestigious courses at, at, at a lower cost. And, and I think that's something we need to think about. Because the way the big brands move affects the entire global uh, marketplace in education. And then we have the large state universities. And what we've seen over the, particularly since the financial crisis of 2008-9, is that there's no shortage of, of recruits. It, there's no shortage of students trying to get into the top universities. They have plenty of students. They don't necessarily have to market to students. The problem for them is that states have been cutting the budgets for those institutions, and they have to have more cost recovery, which means they try to find more full fee-paying students. And I'm going to get into that later, the idea that they have to recruit students from out of state or foreign students who will pay higher tuition costs uh, to help balance their budgets. Then you have the second tier and lower colleges where the key is to get students, and it's just an endless cycle of, of recruiting um, and trying to cut costs, and you're competing constantly for a smaller and smaller pool of students, part of, by, part of that is by discounting tuition. In other words, you cut tuition, you give higher amounts of scholarships to get more students, but that again then affects your net revenue, and that's something we can look at later. And then we have the social sciences in general, which are under pressure from STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, um, where enrollments are growing. And there's pressure to cut, if you like, to cut back spending on social science and liberal arts and growing enrollments in the STEM disciplines. The backdrop to all of this, and again, I'm using United States data, but you can, again, look at any other country's data as well, is in the broader economy, the idea of growing um, inequality. So we have growing inequality and the middle class under increasing amounts of pressure. And that's important because it means that if tuition costs or the cost of college keep rising, then it's harder and harder for people in the middle, in a sense, to afford sending their kids to college without borrowing. And that's something, again, that we've seen in the United States, this explosion of student debt as incomes have not kept up, kept up with the rising costs of a college education. And I would argue, as we can see here, uh, we would link this, I would link everything in a sense to the, the rise of globalization in the 1970s and 80s in a sense, or neoliberal globalization, if you want to call it that way, with increasing amounts of income inequality and, and um, this flow of wealth upwards while uh, a general stagnation in people in the bottom 50%. And we can see this if we look at inequality numbers, uh, that inequalities increase globally, but much faster in, in the United States than in Europe. Right? And again, so you're seeing, if we're looking here at the share of national income, this is not just, um, this is not wages, this is income, earned by the top 10% between 1980, in this case 2016, you can see a rapid rise um, in the share uh, in the United States. And that's, again, the share is uneven globally, but the United States is more pronounced. Um, similarly, if we look at uh, wealth shares, that uh, the top 1% um, have an increasing uh, share of uh, wealth in the United States. But I think it's important to focus on the bottom 50%. And you can see between 1989 and 2019, how the share of the bottom 50% uh, has been consistently has fallen and is low. Um, 
And that's important, again, in terms of, if, in, uh, you know, of mobility, uh, social mobility, but also in terms of uh, the ability to afford college without borrowing money. And, and I think that's important, again, in the context of what's happening. Uh, I'm just drawing on this. I, I, I apologize for this long quote, but I think it's interesting because this is a new book or, uh, that came out, um, and this is from a, an interview with the author, Baldwin, and he, he, he traces the, the Higher Education Act of 1965, which creates a private loan market. And again, if, if anyone's familiar with the United States system, increasingly there's this, this private and federal and state-subsidized loan a loan market, and kids borrow more and more money to go to college. And then the campuses, in a sense, have loaded up with amenities to attract students, and so you have the, the students going on these college tours with their parents, and all the colleges are trying to sell the students uh, on the college, and a lot of the way they sell it is not on the quality of, of the professors or the quality of education, but the quality of amenities, how many swimming pools, how many vegetarian or vegan options they have, et cetera, in the food hall. Um, and so, again, you have this competition between colleges to attract students, particularly below tier one institutions. Um, simultaneously, this cut of state expenditures, you know, there's amount of money the state's giving. And therefore, colleges have to constantly come up with new ways to cut, um, in a sense, uh, to save money, right, or to um, diversify revenue streams. So they have to be more entrepreneurial. And again, so this fits in with uh, the general idea of neoliberalism, the idea of this more entrepreneurial state, if you like. Um, and here, again, I don't want to spend too much time on this. This is just an example of funding in state institutions on how the share of state support for um, institutions in the United States has gradually been falling. And that's important because it means that if state revenue, the amount of state funding is falling, the only way the colleges then can uh, keep up their budgets is either by slashing costs, which could be slashing programs, hiring more adjuncts, uh, you know, replacing uh, more expensive full-time faculty with part-time faculty, consolidating departments, um, or trying to attract more students. I mean, so again, you have to make it up somewhere or raising tuition revenue. And uh, part of that comes in from the states cutting back on their spending. So in the United States, you have this huge unsustainable student debt load, right, where, where students are borrowing more and more money to attend college. Um, you know, Biden, as part of his election pledge, was to cut, cut student debt. Uh, that hasn't happened yet. He was going to wipe out some student debt. Um, what's happened since COVID is that they've cut back uh, on interest payments. There's been a moratorium on student interest payments since COVID, and that's provided a lot of relief to pay to students. But the bottom line is, again, you have this ballooning of student debt where students have been borrowing huge amounts of money, sorry, to attend college. Um, and the borrowing hasn't been equal for all colleges. What's interesting, if you look at the slide, is that the highest rates of, of student indebtedness, in this case, is default rates. In other words, student borrowing and not being able to pay it back. The highest rates of default are in the for-profit colleges, which is, is makes a a lot of sense because the profit colleges um, have often been marketing to the most vulnerable students. Uh, so often large numbers of poor minority students uh, the least able, in a sense, uh, to pay back money have been borrowing the largest sums and therefore defaulting. And, and to the credit, to his credit, uh, Biden has, has um, prioritized, in a sense, forgiving the student debt from schools, from students that were, in a sense, defrauded by these for-profit schools into taking out loans, uh, which they could never pay back, getting degrees, which are often essentially worthless. Um, so one of the arguments that I think is really important, and I'm, I'm, I'm just going to spend a little bit of time on this, is the idea of elite universities as networks. Um, and, and my argument is essentially that 
One of the reasons increasingly people want to go and fight so hard to get into the top universities is because that opens up all these ideas of networking. So the argument isn't often, to me anyway, I don't hear everyone saying, oh, you, you need to go to Harvard because the education's so good. And you go to Harvard in a sense because Harvard is a place where you network, right? So there's this, this, this point that, um, you know, to be a, a, a Harvard dropout in itself is, is prestigious because you went to Harvard. And um, so you have this entrenched sense of privilege of, and, and of getting into these institutions and just getting in gives you this, if you like, a golden entree into entrepreneurial opportunities and into, um, into many more business opportunities. Uh, I use the example of Operation Varsity Blues, which I'm assuming not many people outside the United States are, are familiar with. This was a, uh, a, a, I don't know, a scandal where really, really rich people, sometimes actors, had been essentially bribing their kids in and cheating their kids in to elite colleges. Sometimes, you know, not, not, we're not just talking about Harvard. Some of it is like University of Southern California, paying other people to take um, standardized tests for their students, completely corrupting the system. Um, but that shows you the lengths to which people will go to get their kids in to the, the system. So my argument is that the elite institutions essentially become a hub of connections, not of ideas of knowledge, but essentially of connections to others which enables you then to create or control what I would call the new hubs of connectivity. So for example, you make the connections at these institutions and then you create the new networks that control the global system, in a sense the Facebooks, the Twitters, the Coursera's or the new hedge funds. Um, and that's often coming out of the connections you're making at these institutions. So you know, like um, you know, all Mark Zuckerberg's uh, Roommates at, at at Harvard, are, you know, I, I guess are very rich or are very rich people because they roomed with Mark Zuckerberg, right, at Harvard. So that's how you again make connections. Um, so I'm arguing that the networking opportunities of access to the real physical universities, in a sense, increasing reserve for a global elite. Now, clearly, there's some movement. Not everyone from a global elite is. Not everyone. Uh, for, that gets into these institutions from a global elite is from a global elite, but but most people are. You need to come. You need certain inputs to get in, and then these institutions are now creating branch plans. For example, Cornell in China, or what do you call it, or uh, NYU in Abu Dhabi, and that's again the idea of the university as this networked institution. But again. The, the, the local elites get into those institutions, um, but but um, so basically what I'm saying is you're creating, in a sense, this, this networking opportunity, and networking in, its, in itself is extremely important. It's not the university, it's the networking you make at the university. And I think that's, again, something that comes out of the global system. And, and I, you know, I keep pushing this idea of elite networks, but this was a study which was just done of business computer, business, computer science and history. It looked at 242 schools, and they discovered that of those 242 schools, uh, in those disciplines, one, one quarter of all universities accounted for between 71 and 86 percent of all tenure track faculty. In other words, people who go to elite institutions hire people from elite institutions. And so if we looked at something here, if they're looking at history, half of all history professors in the United States uh, came from eight schools. Right? And again, so this is the idea of how elite networks perpetuate elite networks. And I think that's, that's really important. For if, if we're looking at the, how, in a sense, the educational system is a product of the global system of inequality and then mirrors that global system of inequality and then promotes that global system of inequality. And again, this is just the idea to its nth degree. This was a recent ad, when I say recent, last week. This is UCLA placing an ad for a chemistry professor in biochemistry. Um, and what's interesting about this ad, it says, this is for an assistant adjunct professor and 
without any salary. So you're hiring somebody at no salary, and you have to have a PhD, uh, you have to work, you need five letters of reference, and yet you're getting no salary. So in a sense, you, you're paying to work at UCLA for the, if you like, the networking opportunities that working at UCLA provides. And again, this is just taking my idea of privilege to, in a sense, the nth degree. Uh, there was a lot of pushback from this, um, from this ad, by the way, and in UCLA subsequently, or this department, has subsequently withdrawn it because of the criticism it received. So the new public narrative, I would argue, is that state funding for university needs to be for the public good, and the public good is essentially for programs that are relevant for employment. And that means not essentially the liberal arts. You're training people for work. And graduates, and again, this part of the narrative, the graduates in the social science and humanities are often underemployed or underemployed. Oh, sorry, unemployed or underemployed. Again, in the United States, I don't think there's much proof right now, in, in any event, of much unemployment amongst um, recent graduates. Uh, but historically, there has been um, studies of quite a high degree of underemployment um, of, of graduates in the humanities. But the bottom line is that's the narrative. The narrative is train people for work, and public spending has to be on training people for work. So if we just then move on to enrollment pressures, within the United States, there's a smaller pool of high school students. This is demographics the so-called demographic cliff, and it's projected that by 2025, we're really going to feel the effects of the falling birth rates. So in other words, less students, and then from COVID, the period after COVID, we're seeing uh, falling enrollments. Um, and this has obviously been uneven between schools, and then obviously uneven between what we, uh, uh, dis different disciplines. But the bottom line is there's a smaller pool of potential school students, particularly a smaller uh, um, group of potential students able to pay for college, right, without loans. So most kids have to take out loans, and they're less kids to begin with. So there's more competition for students. And again, there's, there's most of this con con uh, competition is below tier one institutions. Again, this, the private schools below tier one. Uh, then tuition has been rising faster than income, state funding has been cut, and then there's this fierce competition for students. And then, again, departments have been cut, some disciplines have been combined, and there's this rise of STEM. So again, there's this pressure on the liberal arts, but a pressure, a real pressure, I think, uh, on, on universities below tier one. Um, and then, you know, I call it the STEM roller. And, and I'm going to hold, hold the thought about geography. I'm going to get back to geography. But essentially, we've seen this in increasing enrollment in STEM. Uh, and that's important. And I see this at my own institution, where you'll have an, an, a, a, an, a day for potential students, a um, recruitment event, if you like, or an admissions event. And this huge pool of, of, of students or potential students who are interested in biology or biochemistry or whatever, and very few. I, I did an, ad, an admissions event uh, on Sunday. It was set up. I had two hours uh, with potential parents and potential students. I didn't see anyone. I sat there for two hours, saw no one, right, as the chair of geography and global studies. I would bet you that, that biochemistry saw plenty, and that's, again, the idea. Um, that enrollments are changing, enrollment patterns are changing. You can see this in the statistics, uh, the rise between 2008-9 and 2018-19, and 19, how uh, the STEM disciplines have got bigger and bigger and bigger, and the amount of students moving into the STEM disciplines have got bigger. Um, okay, so what do universities do in the face of all these crises, if you like? Well, the first thing they did, and this is even pre-COVID, is they stepped up international recruitment. And clearly, this is a bad strategy post-COVID, but hey, you've got a shortfall of students, you need fee-paying students, full fee-paying students, let's get foreigners, right? So, and I'm going to give you some more um, examples of that later. Then they try to reach out and establish if, what I'm calling branch plants or branch campuses in overseas institutions or in overseas destinations. 
So again, NYU and Abu Dhabi, and creating partnerships with other institutions, often institutions in China. Increasing the discount rate. Now that sounds strange again uh, in Spain, but the discount rate just simply means make cutting deals with students. So if the advertised price of a college is $50,000 a year, you say to the student, okay, we will give you a scholarship for $30,000, and the student's really happy, they're paying 20, and you constantly try to play around with scholarships to attract the students, and if you can get them to, particularly we have a lot of place students living in, dorm, in dorms, actually living on campus, you can then make some of that revenue back uh, by them paying to live on campus. And that's why COVID was so destructive because that revenue stream was taken away because the people were not living on campus, right? So uh, that's important. So the discount rate is, is really important. Um, then you see even state colleges trying to recruit out-of-state students because out-of-state students uh, pay out-of-state tuition. So I know that's, again, hard for foreigners to understand, people outside the United States to understand, but if a student from New York wants to go to university in California, you have to pay, in a sense, the same amount of money as somebody from Spain going to California. Right? In other words, you're treated as a, an out-of-state resident, and you have to pay a lot more money to attend. So you want to attract some of those people because they pay more to go there. Uh, some of the universities, in fact, are now trying to give even in-state tuition to out-of-state students because if you do that, you get them to pay the dorm fees, and again, you get more bodies on campus, and you can raise your revenue. And then you cut costs. You, you try to hire more adjunct faculty, more contingent faculty. You try to give less tenure. Tenure is increasingly rare in the United States. Uh, it's much, much harder to get tenures, um, a tenure job, a job with tenure, a tenure track job. Uh, then you're adding distance learning, trying to work with MOOCs, these online institutions. So all these ways, in a sense, to cut costs. And then the idea of creating new desirable interdisciplinary programs um, and rebranding. That's something I'm going to pick up on again when we get to geography. And again, global studies, sustainability, studies, logistics, food studies, whatever. And then you want to focus on retention and the DFW problem. In other words, once the student's at the institution, you want to keep them at the institution. And that means you don't really want them to drop out. And, and one way to stop them dropping out is to not give Ds and fails and, and withdrawals. So how do we stop that? Well, I would argue one of the ways is, as we see in this constant grade inflation in the United States, where we're giving higher and higher grades to retain students. So again, if we just look at enrollment trends, uh, you see quite clearly, really, when, when uh, with COVID, the, and then firstly with Trump, in international enrollment, that's fallen. Right? So there's been a big fall in international enrollment in the United States. If we look at this period, uh, it reaches a high in 2016-17, and uh, we've seen a quite a dramatic decrease in international students um, in 2020-21. Right? So the OPT is optional practical training. Um, so the, you, you know, the number you really should use is the total, so it's in the third column. You see 914,000, um, and uh, that's a big drop from uh, 16, 17, and 17, 18. International students, again, uh, international students are important. I'm just putting it up because they pay out-of-state tuition. So an this is just used University of Colorado Boulder. An international student would pay $35,000. An in-state student would pay $10,000. So think about the huge difference in tuition. Clearly, if you can get a lot of kids paying $35,000, that's a big difference. Um, so you want to recruit out of state and you want to recruit international students. Um, nearly one third of international students were from China. And again, we see with the election of Trump, that starts falling and it's harder and harder uh, for students to get visas, not just from China, but, but particularly from China. And then, obviously, COVID has a very, very big impact on um, the growth of, of international students. Tuition discounting, I just put this up. 
And again, tuition discounting to me is a race to the bottom. You can't, const no university can survive if you constantly tuition discounting. The Ivy Leagues don't have to do this. The second tier, particularly second tier privates, have to constantly tinker with their models and have to do greater and greater amounts of tuition discounting. Um, I can make these slides available. I don't want to go through all the numbers right here. Uh, and then, of course, the rise of uh, online, ins of online teaching, of MOOCs, of the for-profits, of Coursera's, Udacity's. This was happening long before COVID, but COVID really, in a sense, shows, it speeds up the process and shows how online ins um, teaching is viable, how Zoom teaching, in a sense, is a viable option for many colleges, and also the partnerships between places like Udacity um, and Coursera and then regular um, nonprofit institutions. And that's, again, important. And, and then the, the whole idea of an online elite degree. So I'm using the example of Georgia Tech, sorry, Georgia Institute of Technology, yeah, well, Georgia Tech, Georgia Institute of Technology, who is, a, you know, very prestigious. Uh, they have a highly prestigious master's program in computer science. They create an online version, and they share costs with Audacity, AT&T. And when I did this, this was 2013, the cost was $6,600 for the online versus $45,000 in person. Now, obviously, the problem with the online is you're not making those network connections. Right? And, and I think the networking opportunities of on-campus are really important. But again, what, what I'm trying to point out is if, if big institutions like this create these, in, these programs, these online programs, that squeezes the other tiers of, insta, of the educational structure. Right? So it, it feeds down and it has an effect on, on recruitment down the whole process. Right? So what the big places do affects everyone. And then I don't want to spend too much time on this, but there's not that much sympathy amongst the general population for colleges, so for the problem of colleges. The perception of many colleges in the general population is that they're out of touch, they're elitist, they're too expensive, that professors earn too much money, that professors are too liberal, et cetera. I mean, these are just the public perceptions. I'm not necessarily agreeing with this, but um, there's not a huge amount of sympathy for any of the problems of colleges, right? because the general idea is that colleges, or the general perception in the public, is that colleges are too expensive and the prices have been going up too fast. And let's move on to geography, right? So let's move on to geography specifically. And I, I like this idea to begin with. This was a 2010 national assessment uh, looking at geography or geographical education in the United States and said, there's a widespread ignorance of our own country and of its place in the world. This was of a, of a big survey that they did of Americans. And in 2014, I find this interesting because this, uh, of what's happening in Ukraine right now, that this was after the invasion of um, the Crimea. And 84% of the people surveyed of 2,066 people could not identify the Ukraine on a map, um, and what was interesting, again, was the least, less likely you were able to locate Ukraine, the more likely you were to argue that the U.S. should intervene on behalf of Ukraine. Um, but generally speaking, there's, there's this widespread geographical ignorance uh, in the United States. And some of this has to do with the idea that, that really geography is not taught in any real sense at high schools or in junior schools. And the perception of geography is generally that it's not a very important subject and that teachers don't spend much time on it. They don't, um, they don't get enough support. They don't have enough instructional materials. And generally, there's just a greater degree of geographical ignorance and lack of awareness of the importance of geography in the United States. And I'm going to give you some reasons at a college level later, but, but clearly what we deal with at a college level is something that filters through from the bottom up. Right? It's not, it doesn't just begin at a college level. If, if geography is ignored as a subject at high schools, then clearly it's going to affect what happens at college. And 
If we look at basic geographical issues at a college level, geography departments are generally much smaller than uh, neighboring disciplines like history, for example. Um, very, you know, many small colleges, community colleges don't offer geography. Um, even as I pointed out, the Ivies a lot don't have geography programs except for Dartmouth. Um, very few people know what geographers do. They don't know what geography is, right? So that, that's a big problem in the general population. Uh, social studies replace geography as a discipline, and within social studies, history is generally much more important than geography. And I'll say a few things about AP geography in a second. Um, but even within the large universities, so when you look at the largest universities of geography, who have the best reputation is in, in geography, mostly that reputation is based on graduate studies, graduate programs. They don't have that many geography majors, particularly in comparison to other majors. So in the US, they created something called advanced placement exams. Now, if advanced placement is, is are tests which students take at a high school level. And if they get a certain amount of points in the AP test, that's a, that's a scale of one to five, but generally if you score five, four, sometimes three, you are then given a college credit in that discipline. And that's really important because high school students increasingly take as many AP credits as you can because it means you can then go to university and you don't have to take courses at the university because if you take these AP credits, you can transfer them to a university level. So in geography, for in 2001, they created an advanced placement exam in human geography, and that has become really um, popular. Um, currently, you know, in 2020, over 200,000 students took advanced placement human geography. That's a lot of students. And the theory is that expands geographical knowledge. Well, obviously, it, it introduce more students to geography. But the theory would be then that more of those students in theory would then go to college and take geography. So Kaplan, who was an old uh, a past president of the Association of American Geographers, he poses a couple of two important questions, I think, about AP geography. He says, is the curriculum as rigorous as the same course in college? In other words, is this comparable to a college class in human geography. And generally, his argument is yes. The, the pass rate for the um, AP human geography class is only about uh, just over 50%. If I remember correctly, it's like 53 54%. So he argues it's highly rigorous. But again, if we take the, the, the 218,000 students uh, who took the exam, essentially only 100,000 plus, 110,000 of them, 120,000 are passing with a score of three plus. Um, so he's saying, yes, it's, it is rigorous enough and, and we can compare it to a college class. Some, some universities would disagree with that, but that's his argument. But the second point, which is more important, I think, is does it help geography programs or does it cannibalize geography enrollments? In other words, are these students then entering university to take geography classes, or are they entering university with these credits, and now they don't take geography classes? And he argues that, that the evidence is more towards the latter. In other words, this is not helping geography enrollments to any degree. My experience is, would back that up. I mean, I find uh, students coming in with uh, advanced placement geography, they're getting a university credit, but they're not necessarily taking any more classes in our department. It's not necessarily attracting students. And I think this is really important. Um, and I think if we're looking at the decline of the liberal arts, we have to look at AP, because again, if kids are coming in with a lots of AP credits, they don't have to take a lot of intro classes um, in the liberal arts, and they could just focus on uh, what their major is. Um, and that's something I see quite a lot, because I do a lot of advisement, something I see a lot when I look at transcripts. Um, why is geography, or why has geography education in the United States um, fallen behind, or did it fall behind, let's say, geography education in, in Britain? Um, Murphy, again, another past president of the Association of American Geographers, he comes up with various reasons for the decline of uh, the teaching of, of geography at universities. 
he, he looks, uh, he situates, if you want, into early 20th century American isolationism, and then after the war, the idea uh, that with the rise of American you know, capitalism and, and Americanism and American power, it was less important to study other societies because they were increasingly going to look alike, if you want. Uh, then the growing prestige of the sciences, the hard sciences, and then within the social sciences, the growing importance of subjects like economics, which can do models, and the modeling, in a sense, can ignore regional variations or ignore place. Um, then he points to what I think is extremely important, the idea of the marginalization of geography of primary and secondary schools, something I've said before. Then the division in geography is something which I'm going to touch on a bit later, between physical and human geography, that geography really straddles this, this strange divide, and often is, is, it's hard to categorize where you put a geography department into. And that's something I'm going to pick up in a, in a few minutes. And then the idea that geography often is just a cataloging of facts about the earth. And again, when I talk to students and say, what is geography? Often they'll say, oh, where things are, um, or naming capital cities. There's very little understanding of, of, of geography really as an explanatory discipline. So what do we see? If, if we look at the US in degrees conferred, you do see after the Second World War a rapid increase in line with other disciplines and the rise of new colleges in the United States uh, of enrollments. But it, there's a big drop between 2007 8 which is really the financial crisis, uh, and then 1718, you can see the numbers of students uh, taking geography or degrees conferred uh, falls um, across the board, right, in masters, PhDs, etc. And I think the BABS is interesting as well because with the rise of GIS and, and physical geography, we've seen, if you like, more stress on BS programs and in, in in why we need a BS program or an MS program. Now, the Master of Science or Bachelor of Science, in a sense, becomes more important than a Bachelor of Arts or Master of Arts. And I think that's a, a change in emphasis as well. Um, this is just historical trends. I don't, this is from Murphy. And again, you can see the rise, a dip in the 70s and 80s, which really corresponds to the period before the rise of GIS, and then a pickup again with the rise of GIS uh, from the 80s and 90s. This is also important. We, we're still producing PhDs, but increasingly there's a gap, and this is again from Wharton by Kaplan, um, that we're producing more PhDs than there are full-time academic positions in, in geography. And that's important because I, I would argue that full-time academic positions in geography are not only falling, tenure track positions are falling, but I think we also have to spend more time looking at the composition of those positions. That if you are got a PhD in human geography, it's less likely that you're gonna find a tenure track position than if you are a GIS person and you're doing geospatial technology. And that's something else we need to think about. This is gets back to something I said before. This is just stats I put together, but you can get an idea if we take Rutgers, for example, which is a very good geography program, um, the big university has over 30,000 students, State University of New Jersey. When I did these statistics, which are 2009-10, there were only, according to the statistics, this is self-reported statistics. And just, these are numbers that Rutgers provided to the Association of American Geographers. They only had 69 undergrad majors. I mean, that's nothing. Um, and so even big departments or the prestigious departments, the departments we think as the premier sources of knowledge, of geographical knowledge in the United States, often have very, very low numbers of undergraduate students. And, and that to me is, again, telling us something and is, is a problem. Um, and what are the challenges that geography programs, particularly undergraduate geography? Um, that most geography programs, I used the example of Rutgers a minute ago, get their reputation, their good reputation, through graduate education. And so there's hardly any focus on undergraduates and attracting undergraduates and having undergraduate directors and, and doing undergraduate enrollments and working with high schools, et cetera. The focus is 
on graduate programs. And the problem is that administrators increasingly want to see numbers at an undergraduate level. They want to see numbers of students coming into the university to take a discipline. And if your focus is on graduate, you're not getting those undergraduate numbers to protect your department. Undergraduate programs really struggle to attract students coming into the college because students don't have a knowledge. So a program like mine, we get the vast majority of our majors from students already at the university. They're coming in to do something else and they change to our program. They don't come in to take our program. And that's again a big problem. We're not a, geography is not attracting enough students into the discipline to begin with at an undergraduate level. Most students have no idea what geography is until they take a geography class. So most recruitment happens within geography classes, in a sense. Um, and why are they taking those classes? Mostly they're taking the geography classes to fulfill a university requirement. But even that becomes highly problematic if students have to take less university requirements because maybe they have more AP credits or they're coming in to take... Um, they do, they do biology or whatever, and they have to take less of these classes, and so they're not discovering um, geography. And then something which I really uh, find frustrating at a personal level is the idea that we create more and more programs, and as we proliferate programs and we proliferate requirements, that crowds out the ability of students to take geography. So if students are in honors college, they have less chance to take geography classes. If students are doing food studies or writing, you know, food studies or, you know, whatever studies, there's less reason for them to take geography. If we create classes with specific requirements that has to be writing intense or whatever, again, there's less reason or less opportunity to take geography classes. So there's a crowding out, and if students are not discovering the classes, they're not going to then major in the program. And then something we have to think about. Increasingly, geography programs are rebranding themselves, i.e. not calling themselves geography programs. And I find this really interesting because I'm not aware of many disciplines where people try to run away from the name of their discipline, if you think about it. I mean, there are not too many history departments, I'm assuming, who don't want to be called a history department or how many, you know, or an economics department not wanting to be called an economics department. But in geography, we have the strange situation where more and more programs, in a sense, are rebranding themselves as something else, including dropping the word geography from the name of the program. Um, I use this as, I use the AAG Guide to Programs in Geography, and you can see this, that the percentage of, of, of programs with the name geography declines over time. Now, this is not a perfect measure, but not every program in America is in the AAG guide. So this is not a, by any means definitive. Um, but it does give you some idea of the pressure to rebrand. Um, and this is something I put together with one of my uh, ex-students. And again, you know, geology and geography, geography and anthropology, geography and planning, geography and urban planning. Um, geography, sociology, economics, anthropology, history, and geography. These are just joint departments. But again, you have programs, geography and development, global studies and geography, environmental studies, international studies. And there's the idea that geography programs are increasingly trying to fit into something else and rebrand. Um, earth studies, earth sciences, um, etc. And then something we have to think about as well, that increasingly when you create these interdisciplinary programs within a geography department or even competing with the geography department, often you end up cannibalizing enrollments in geography. This was a fairly old study now done by uh, Keith Anderson, who um, was in the, is, is part of the Middle States. He's a professor in um, Pennsylvania. And he was looking at the creation of environmental studies and the environmental science program. Uh, he was looking at his own program and he surveyed 144 heads of geography departments. And basically, the bottom line was as these programs were created, you saw a decrease in enrollments in geography. In other words, they were cannibalizing geography enrollments. Um, 
he's at Villanova, uh, and you see this right here, that, for example, as the other programs become more popular, we see a decline in geography majors. Now, I would argue this isn't necessarily replicable everywhere. Uh, we, in, at, at Hofstra, we designed the Global Studies program to kind of complement the geography program. So, in fact, we, we, Global Studies has been has, has leveraged more students into geography, but that's because we were able to, in a sense, design that in the ground up, from the ground up. But on the other hand, the creation of other programs like sustainability studies, peace studies, et cetera, really has... Uh, policy studies have gradually whittled away. They've, they've, they've lowered enrollments in global studies, and by lowering the enrollments in global studies, that's affected enrollments in geography. So again, the more interdisciplinary programs you create, the more focus you're taking away from, from your geography program. And then you also have rebranding in terms of the names of courses. Um, this was a really, really interesting study done by Stoller Pearson, in Gaussian, uh, they gave a really good talk. It's available online. You could, it was an AAG talk. Um, you can get access to it uh, online. And they looked at rebranding and renaming of classes. And this is, again, I find really interesting. How do we attract students into our classes? They looked at the names that attract students to taking a class. So for example, geography scored really badly compared to something like society, or geosciences was not as, as popular as global studies or environment. In other words, if you can create classes with certain key words, you're going to attract more students than if you just use human geography as the title of your class. So in other words, we're seeing this double rebranding, rebranding departments with different names, and then this attempt to rebrand classes with different names. So for example, looking at the language here, if you put place into the title of a class, it's much more likely to get students than if you put something like cartography, right? Or power rather than political economy. And it's simply just rebranding by naming. And this is an example. I'm on a list of, of um, chairs of various geography departments, and we, we had these big discussions about rebranding and naming back in 2020. And this is just some of the examples I pulled out. But for example, a, a geography of health and disease class becomes global health and diseases. Or food justice, geographic perspectives, uh, replaces geography of food. Or human geography becomes society, space, and power. Um, environmental geography becomes, you know, our global environment. In other words, you modernizing and changing curriculums, I use this in, in scare quotes, um, simply to attract students, changing the names, rebranding. And again, a lot of this involves dropping the name geography from classes. And this is something which we have to be aware of as geographers. If we're taking the word geography out of our programs and we're dropping the word geography from our classes, what does that say about our faith in our own discipline? I mean, that's something we need to think about, right? Um, but at my university, we did this, right? After this rebranding, we looked at this and we renamed our human geography class. We renamed our regional geography class, again, to try to attract more students. And, and it's too early, in a sense, to tell whether that's happened or not. Another issue has to do with STEM and geography. I said previously, geography can take advantage of the rise of STEM because it really is a program which sits on this fulcrum between human, you know, between the social sciences and the natural sciences. And this has been really interesting because increasingly programs have tried to rebrand themselves as sciences. And at my university, what we did was uh, we managed to make our introduction to GIS class, uh, which we also renamed into something I can't remember, uh, but we, we managed to get that class counted as a science class in the, um, in the general education requirements. And that was amazing. We, 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 we tried to get enrollments in GIS and fought and fought for 15 years. And the, you know, we would run one class with a maximum enrollment of 22 students. And suddenly, by getting it rebranded, getting it counted as a science class, we're suddenly running four classes this semester uh, with 35 students each. 
In other words, we we could run we could run more. I mean, if we had the facilities, we don't have enough labs. But that's simply through just changing the classification. But the problem is this really can affect department balance. I was an external reviewer at a at a college I'm not, I'm not going to name where there were some issues and all the human geographers stayed in a geography department and created a department of human geography and all the physical geographers and GIS basically left, went to a different college and took advantage of, of a new department with geology and GIS and spatial studies. So that created an enormous division within the programs because there's so much more focus now and so much more funding for, for geosciences as opposed to human geography. So this is not a um, really an academic debate. This is really an important debate that has enormous implications for where departments, um, the future of geography departments. And I don't have an easy answer. And it really is a double-edged sword how we situate our departments um, and something we have to be aware of. Uh, it, this is just basic. I was just giving some, these are just some ideas of strategies for growth, partly about if you want your department to grow, you have to, the chair, whoever's in charge of a department, has to really advocate within the university constantly and engage with program promotion. You have to just constantly, in a sense, embrace this neoliberal ideology and sell. I mean, essentially, you become seller, a salesman. You have to sell your program. And then you have to try to create synergies with other programs. You, you can't just compete. You have to try to create some ability, but each leverage the advantages of other programs and work with it. Um, but my argument is you can't simply combine departments and expect it to work. You can't take, for example, an anthropology department, dump it in a global studies and geography department, and think that's going to work. It isn't, because what interest would that chair have of promoting those three disciplines? On the other hand, if you create, like, like we did in our department, we created a global studies and, and the program with the geography program. You, in a sense, can, can work together to raise enrollments. But you can't take two destination majors and dump them in the same place or amalgamate departments and think that all these majors are going to thrive. I, I don't think that's, that makes any sense. Um, and then I would argue the faculty have to uh, have an interest in the department. That that's, must, might sound obvious, but it's not obvious. Particularly in tenured faculty, they have grants, they have research interests, and those interests are not generally in advisement, recruiting, etc. And And if you have your faculty who are not interested, in a sense, in building a department and working for the department, it's very hard to have a department that, that is thriving. Uh, I, and again, this is pre-COVID, but I believe faculty need to be on campus. And that doesn't happen all the time. A lot of faculty only come to campus to teach, and they, you never see them. And uh, that's a problem. Faculty have to help in recruiting and advisement. And, and again, particularly this is for undergraduate departments. You need a sense of identity. You need links to your alumni. You have to do outcomes assessment. In other words, you have to know where you're, what you achieve. You have to know what your alumni are doing and you have to have links with them. In other words, why do you need to do this? I would argue you need to do this when your dean calls you in and says, we want to cut your department, and you say, no, 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 don't cut our department because we're doing all these great things, and not only are we doing these great things, I can contact 200 alumni who will tell you that, right? Because this is your, your strength in a sense. So you need this as a survival mechanism, right? You have to create these links. And be pragmatic. In other words, don't say no to everything. We have to understand that things are changing. We have to be pragmatic. And you have to know what your strengths and weaknesses are. I mean, you have to be realistic. You have to be pragmatic. Um, and again, Lobin was a, also a past president of the Association of American Geography. And she says, you know, and I think this is good advice, align your strategies with institution priorities. In other words, if you're, you, you need to know what your institution wants, and your department, particularly a geography department, you have to do whatever you can to align with that. Um, not always that easy, but you have to try and do that. And you need to work with other parts of the institution. You have to create partnerships. You have to be, in a sense, a good citizen. Um, again, not easy because it requires work, but you have to, in a sense, play the game. You can't, 
You know, if you want, you want your geography department to survive, you, in a sense, have to go by the metrics of the institution and work with those metrics. So, and again, I'm giving somewhat contradictory advice here because on the one hand, I'm, I'm not necessarily agreeing with where we are or supporting with where we are, but I'm advising, hey, we have to be pragmatic because this is where we are. All right, I would argue that the biggest problem, and I'm this is to conclude, I'm arguing that essentially the, the problem that I've had uh, as a department chair and I've seen other department chairs have and it, is, is that there's no coherence. There's, there's, in a sense, strategic incoherence within university leadership. And again, it's not an indictment of where I work, it's just this something I've observed, that there's often a piecemeal approach that without strategic guidance, without strategic vision, universities just add programs. They, just, they don't necessarily think about how adding new programs affect enrollments in existing programs. More often just takes away enrollments from other programs. So you need an absolute strategic logic in what you're doing. Then adding requirements and, and different university requirements also often is done without any thought on how it affects existing programs. And I'll just give you an easy example. Our program used to recruit a lot of students from a different school, journalism, journalism students who are in a different school, school of communications. Um, we added some new requirements in our college and suddenly it's really hard for us to recruit journalism students because they can't meet those requirements. But there was no thought when those requirements were put in place on how that would affect recruiting, for example, from another school. And that's why you need coherent vision, and that's not always there. And then my argument would be you shouldn't be adding new programs unless it's going to increase, in a sense, revenue for the school by introducing new students. But if it's just moving students between programs, I don't necessarily see the advantage of this piecemeal addition of, of more and more programs, right? The main problem is not programs, but what we teach and, and, and um, recruiting students to begin with, right? Um, okay, so let's see. The, the second point there I think is extremely important. I think colleges have to start thinking about not the, as departments simply as a metric, as a cost center. You have to look at departments, A, why do we need disciplines? What does a discipline bring? A university needs the liberal arts and sciences. We need languages. We need certain disciplines like history or sociology or, or, ge or geography. And we, that goes beyond cost centers. That's the, the core mission. The, edu the mission of a university is to educate. But if the metric is simply numbers, then we shouldn't just look at the metrics in terms of departments. We should rather look, try to work out a way that departments work together. So for example, uh, there's often very little incentive at universities for different departments to work together because you're competing for numbers. You have to set up mechanisms where you're not. Sociology, you know, if, if there's more students in sociology, that's not necessarily a bad thing for geography. But that's the way, you know, the universities are using metrics that often mean that me as the chair of global studies and geography has no interest in trying to tell a student, hey, don't do geography, do sociology, because that's bad for my metrics. And that's not, I think that serves students badly, it serves universities badly. We need another way of, of, of doing things. And that might mean that the universities have to rethink what a destination major is versus a service major. In other words, maybe you, you have a major because it serves an educative process, um, purpose in the general education curriculum, and it doesn't really matter how many majors you have. That's not the goal. The goal is that it serves a role and, and it, it really backs up other programs. So for example, even GIS, our GIS program is not just serving geography students, it's serving engineers, it's serving geology, it's serving other disciplines. So simply to say, oh, you don't have enough majors in GIS, misses the point, because if you get rid of GIS, you, the engineers are not gonna be able to do GIS. In other words, you have to look at the metrics beyond the department into what we serve. 
So to conclude, I would argue a neoliberal ideology has taken root in university governance. Universities are replicating the same contradictions and inequalities that occur within broader society. Uh, we're seeing the same inequality in incomes, right, between in universities where uh, administrators often earn huge salaries, people in the business school. In the U.S., often football coaches earn huge salaries, uh, while adjunct faculty get paid virtually, you know, living wage. I mean, and, and, and so again, the broader inequalities are replicated at a university level. And if we want universities, if we want geography to survive, we have to keep, in a sense, selling the relevance of geographies. Um, and then, again, there's, there's all these contradictions which we have to think about in, in, within the global system. The idea that university administrators, for example, in the US are embracing distance learning, but also still investing huge amounts on campus and, and buildings, et cetera. I mean, that, that contradiction has to be squared. Then, and, and this is something I, th I feel very strongly about, that our universities, correctly, I think, are putting this promotion of equity, diversity, inclusion in the forefront. This is a big mantra, equity, um, diversity, inclusion. But how do you square this then if you have a campus in China? How do you square this if you have a campus in Abu Dhabi? Or how do you square this, in other words, how do you create um, these partnerships with institutions in societies which, to be charitable, are not based on equity, diversity, and inclusion? This is something which is uncomfortable, but I think we have to look at and, and, and think about. Um, we have to think about quality. We can't just think about getting more and more students. We have to think about the quality of what we teach. We have to think about uh, giving students the, the, what they pay for, in a sense. We can't just take money from students and not give them the education they deserve. We have to think about student indebtedness. Um, we have to think about what we teach and we shouldn't be run by corporations in a sense. Um, and basically, what I'm arguing here is that we have to be really careful in this environment that we don't allow education for careers to replace education for education, right? That, that knowledge in itself is a valuable commodity. And we have to sell that rather than uh, allowing ourselves, in a sense, to just be, uh, to go down this neoliberal rabbit hole of um, accepting that, uh, that knowledge is simply about jobs. And I'm going to stop there. So thank you. And, I'll <laughs> and I will take questions. I know there's a lot of stuff and a lot of material, and uh, I went quite fast. All right, okay, well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Saf. I think that uh, you provide us an overall picture of uh, the situation at the university in the American context, and also then specifically uh, looking at the peculiarities and the characteristics and the needs and the challenges of the geography department. So thanks very much uh, for your presentation. I think you touched into a lot of points and uh, some are specific of um, the American context, but others I think resonate quite close to, to our experience. So we open the time for the questions. Uh, we have here uh, some questions. Uh, and Maria Dolores Garcia Ramon asks, uh, why do you think that geography is not important in American universities? I had heard that perhaps because physical geography is, mo is not important, I find it difficult that maybe that is the case, but it seems true that social and cultural geography is much more important in the U US in comparison with uh, Western Europe, so that the physical, no, that, uh, that source, the question is that, in general, why uh, geography? And especially if we compare also with the context of other countries like the uh, United Kingdom, um, is not that relevant, and then the position of the physical geography versus the social and cultural geography. Okay, uh, that's a good question. Um... So let's start with the premise. Firstly, I, I don't think uh, 
I'm not buying the idea that geography is not important. Right? Geography clearly is important to me, and I think geography is important. But I think geography as a discipline compared to the other social sciences is less taught. Right? So it's less important in the context of what is taught uh, at the universities. The departments are smaller, et cetera. In terms of physical geography, again, uh, you know, the, the issue is, gets back to this idea that geography is this fulcrum between, between if you like, the social sciences and the, and the more hard sciences. So physical geography, in a sense, can be taught in geology departments, in earth sciences departments. Same with, with, with uh, GIS, right? GIS doesn't have to be taught in a geography department. And then geography departments themselves have this division, often between the natural sciences and the hard sciences, and some programs are much more well known for the physical environment, you know, for physical geography, but some are focused mostly on human geography. It's very hard, at, particularly in small departments, to do both and, and to adequately cover um, the disciplines. I can talk about the situation you know, in, in Western Europe. Um, I don't know how each geography department is structured, but I find it hard to believe um, but human geography as a discipline is getting the same amount of focus and funding and, and is not under the same types of pressure as it is in, um, in the US. I mean, again, if I was advising a student uh, and who wanted to become an academic, my guess is there's many more jobs in, in GIS, geospatial technology, et cetera, than there are tenure track jobs in, in human geography. I don't know if that answers the question. Well, I think that to a great extent, we also have experienced the, you know, the, the growing importance of GIS and the uh, need of a faculty in that sense, and also the interest of students. And it somehow, it, as you pointed out, had helped to balance uh, the, uh, the structure of, of the geography departments. I want to say that if there is any question that could be, uh, that people may have, I can also, um, I can also write, they can write in English, I, sorry, in Catalan or Spanish, and then I, sure. I will translate it, so I think that will facilitate also the process. Uh, we have another question re, uh, very, uh, regarding to rebranding. You had pointed out uh, and also, uh, the, it says, uh, we had seen this in the departments, it's happening also in Spain. It, in the last, not just now, in the last 15, 20 years, we had seen all this tendency to rebranding. So the question is, what do you think? Is that a sign of the weakness of the geography or is a strength of the geography as far as interdisciplinary approach with other disciplines? What do you think about that? I mean, that's an interesting question. So I'm going to answer it in, in a strange way. I'm not technically a geographer, right? I'm, I'm, I'm a, my PhD is in urban planning, my training is in urban planning. And what I find mystifying, because I've spent a huge amount of time on, 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 uh, as a, in a geography department, I'm a geography professor, I've uh, been in geography associations, and I find it mystifying to be part of a discipline where people are running away from the name of the discipline. I mean, it's, it's, it's strange. I've, I'm not ashamed to say I'm an urban planner. It seems to me um, quite strange that people don't want to say I'm a geographer. Um, but I understand from a, from a strategic point of view why it makes sense, particularly in the American context where people don't understand what geographers do. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with administrators, and it's clear to me they have no clue what geography is and but even global studies, I mean, as, as somebody who created a global studies program, I get, you know, it really irks me when, when people say, oh, global studies, you must do study abroad. We, you, no, we, we study, you know, globalization. We don't, we're not a study abroad program. Um, and so on the one hand, I think there's something wrong with the idea that we can't, as geographers, articulate why we should keep geography and why geography is important. I think that's a problem. But at the same time, I get your point that the, the, the fungibility, the flexibility of geography is a strength in that you can rebrand and you can be interdisciplinary, and that is good. But I think interdisciplinarity, which keeps geography at the core, 
is really important. I think interdisciplinarity, which loses the focus of geography, is dooming geography to irrelevance. I, I, I really am, I mean, I, I really agonize in, about changing the name of our geography class. It was not something that I did or I supported willingly. Um, I thought it was very important that the word geography was in every one of our classes. But that's not the case anymore, we, we, you know, we, because you have to be practical. So I, I get your point, and I think it's a really important point, that in a sense it's a weakness and a strength of geography, this flexibility. Yeah, we had uh, the comment also here um, com uh, uh, referring to the fact of the strategy to rebranding, to changing the names. And uh, Maria Dolores Garcia was saying, in my opinion, I think it's more a sign of weakness uh, and a lack of faith on our, on our own discipline, uh, probably, than uh, on strength. And yeah. that's a, she said, that's in fact my opinion. But uh, I would say that it, it captures quite well uh, the general mood and the opinion of, of uh, of different departments and disciplines, and we had seen the rebranding in uh, the name of the departments, and as you mentioned, too, and this is also a kind of re uh, relates well to our own experience, to the name of courses, okay. that the need to change the course to make it more appealing, and as you say, if you say it, um, uh, global studies is more appealing than just human geography, for instance, yeah. no? that we had encountered. So, um, as again, if uh, in the chat or uh, in the questions, I think I have now, I have to just, yeah, here we have another question. It's Angel Arones Cisneros. He said, it's, thank you, it's a very good presentation. I am passionate about rural geography and I promote uh, young people to study geography in the Andes of Peru, but they do, they do not know what their field of action is. Uh, what is why I form, uh, I form uh, the Rural Andean Geographic Research Institute that uh, tries to provide more information about geography. Do you think rural geography is important today or has no future? So that's a, a very specific question now uh, over the role of, of, of the uh, goal and the future of uh, rural geography. Well, well I, I don't think it's my place to say what you do has no future. I think, uh, you know, one of, one, one of the, the, I was told before I started the talk that I'm too gloomy and I need to be uh, more upbeat. So uh, to be more upbeat, I think, uh, I, firstly, I, I, I congratulate you on doing what you're doing. Um, no, I, I don't see any, any lack of future in rural geography any more than I see a lack of future in urban geography. I mean, you know, um, the geography is multifaceted. I think it's really important to, to stay rural geography. I think it's important to draw links between rural, urban, uh, between what, you know, between land issues, between food issues, between climate change. I mean, you can draw all of that and link that to, to globalization, to, to urbanization, et cetera. So I think it's important. Um, but in terms of a, a focus at a university, if you can get funding and you can convince people to fund it, I, I don't see no reason why you can't have a specialty in rural geography. I mean, some lead me to, you know, I, we, we have a center in my university in suburban studies, and I'll be honest, when they created it, I was not uh, a supporter. I didn't think we should do suburban studies. I was particularly thought, uh, you know, in geography we have urban studies, why don't we have urban studies? And we can study suburbs as part of urban studies. But it's been very successful, and, and they study suburbs. And um, I think it's, you know, there's space for all of this, and if it's promoted correctly, and uh, I think you're doing a good thing. Right. All right. Uh, I don't know if there is any question. Uh, actually, I can, I can uh, translate it. Uh. First of all, thank you very much for your excellent conference. Uh, to uh, make closer to, to us uh, the geography in the United States, because it's some, some things are uh, closer than our problems. Some, some things are very different. And 
is in, in this question, uh, uh, I have uh, my, my question. Uh, at the beginning of your conference, you speak about uh, first tier, second tier, uh, non-profit versus for profit, or uh, research institutions for scholar, uh, schools, state versus private. But in the second part, you all uh, make all, only one type of uh, universities. I, I, I guess that the geography is not in research institutions or not in private uh, universities, not in first uh, tier. Uh, is like this or is uh, more... Uh, no, no I, I, if, if that was the impression I gave, that wasn't what I was trying to do. Um, geography is taught... I mean, it's many of, of the best known geography departments in the United States are, in, are in top tier state institutions like Penn State or Rutgers. They, have, they are, are state institutions. They have excellent, excellent geography programs. There are private schools like Clark University, uh, which has a very good and well-known geography department. Um, there are many second tier institutions that have geography departments. Uh, so it's across the board. I mean, Berkeley, UCLA uh, have geography departments. But Dartmouth, which is, as I said, Ivy League, has, a, has an excellent geography department. So it varies. Um, I think, though, that in terms of enrollment pressures, I think across the board, I mean, I can't, I, you know, I can't speak about Dartmouth, so clearly I'm making some generalizations. But generally speaking, even the, the big state tier one research institutions do not get that many students coming in to study geography from high school. Right? And that's a problem to me. And, and another problem that I've encountered through conversations or through speaking to people who teach at tier one institutions is that the focus of those institutions is research and graduate students. And there's not that much focus on liaising with uh, high schools, with getting students into the college, which is understandable. But the metrics, the, the, the administrations of the institutions increasingly look how many students are taking the undergraduate classes, how many people are in your classes, how many majors do you have. So you have this mismatch then between very good geography departments focusing on graduates while the administration is saying, well, why aren't you bringing in students? So you have this mismatch. Um, my focus, correctly, I've spent a lot of time looking at tier two of or lower institutions um, because I think the, the educational landscape, not only in the United States, but, but in, in many other countries, is going through a crisis where there's going to be a sorting process. Some places are not going to survive. There's going to be many institutions, particularly in the United States, that are going to close. And the geography, unfortunately, is, is seen sometimes as a luxury discipline. It's not something that's seen as essential. But the, the liberal arts itself are threatened. Within the liberal arts, geography itself is not always taught or it's seen as not a particularly important discipline by some of our administrators. And I think there's this huge pressure. So what I was trying to paint, maybe not successfully, is the idea that the tier one institutions are safe. The, the, the Ivy Leagues and the top private schools, they can do whatever they want. They have enough funding, you know, they, they, they have enough money forever. The, 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 the big institutions like Rutgers or Penn State, even though they, they're very successful and can get students, because they, they, their state funding is variable, they are, departments are threatened, not necessarily geography departments, but there's, a, there's financial problems. Um, but as you go down the, the tiers, I think the threats become bigger and bigger and bigger, um, not only for departments, but for the survival of the institutions. Um, I cannot see personally how the current U.S. system of, of all these thousands of colleges are, is going to survive. It, it's inconceivable to me with the rise of MOOCs, with distance education, with, with costs, that this, this landscape is going to continue. That's, 
So I, I apologize if my focus wasn't enough on, on, those, on those colleges, but um, yeah, so what else? Any follow-up? Okay, uh, I don't, we don't have any other question right now in the chat. I just wanted to point out that, I mean, what's interesting, uh, your talk in the fact that you link what's going on at the global scale and you link the dominant neoliberal ideology. And then uh, you translate it and I think you, you provide enough evidence of how that it works uh, within the university frame and how does affect uh, the social science and the humanities disciplines, and within that, exactly what is the position in which geography is, is placed now. And uh, goes back, I would say, I will point out what you play, put emphasis at the end, uh, we should keep reminding us, us as a professor or as a scholar, so also as a member of the university, and also remember to the, to the institution, what is the core goal? What is the core goal of the university, which ultimately uh, is education? And I think that your talk, and I want to thank you for that, uh, part of uh, providing a very interesting insights about the logics and the dynamics of geography within the American context, also help us to provide and to pinpoint the contradictions and the tensions in which the university has to live now, uh, and also specifically uh, the, the situation that our geography departments face uh, in the present context. So I think that, uh, I mean, there were a lot of points that I think um, your reflections will be very interesting because we will have, we will keep the, um, we uh, register the, the talk, so I think uh, a lot of elements within the difference that we can encounter between the United States and here, still a lot of elements that you talk about, the importance that the professors have to be on campus, the importance that or they need that the professors have to think about what is their role within the university. Are they mainly focused on um, research or do they have a commitment in the functioning of the departments? You know, all these elements, I think, resonate quite, quite well with our present situation. But, but, but the problem with that is that it's also buying into the paradigm. So there's the contradiction, right? That in, on the one hand, we're criticizing the paradigm but for us to survive, we have to, in a sense, embrace and buy into the paradigm, and that's unfortunately where we are, right? And, and that's just, you know, so, so the idea that I'm not a professor but a car salesman is, is very distressing because essentially what are we doing? We, we, I need bodies, and, what do we, and how do we get bodies? So what are we doing? We're recruiting, recruiting, and retaining. And, and I find that sometimes the mission gets lost in that process, but that's what we often reduce to, in a sense. Um, and these pressures are coming down globally. I don't think this is just an American thing. I think unless you're in a very privileged institution, this is what we're all facing, particularly as, as department chairs. Right. Okay, so uh, I don't see any other question. Um, so thanks so much. Thanks Thank so much you. for uh, your presentation. By the way, well, just one thing. You talk a lot about STEAM enrollment. The well, STEAM, I came as and, a, a and, STEAM And you said, uh, you said, well, biomedical and sometimes sorry, uh, sorry. The, the STEAM uh, specialities, STEM. STEM, sorry. STEM, sorry. sorry. Uh, but uh, I want, if you could clarify, because not everybody uh, well, STEM, would be STEM. absolutely familiar well, with right. that. Well, STEM is just the idea. It's an acronym for... Uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. That essentially, um, that's shorthand for this movement and the increasing importance of those disciplines. And, and again, this is, this is not a critique. I mean, that's the way the world's working, that uh, we need more computer scientists, we need more engineers, we need more people in those fields. So I'm not cri criticizing that. But essentially, geography in this is interesting because we can, if we want, move our discipline in that direction 
and, and many departments are trying to get reclassified, reclassify their programs as STEM. And in fact, in, in our own department, we created a Bachelor of Science degree in GIS um, because that enables students in biology or chemistry or engineering to double major with GIS and use GIS. So we, we try to fit in. So, so this is important, and I'm not trying to um, uh, underplay that importance, um, but that's where we are, that, that in the sense, you, the, the people who run funding see funding for STEM as crucially important, but often that that is at the expense of languages, the liberal arts, the humanities, et cetera. And that, that, that's the part that I find unfortunate. All right. Yeah, maybe also if you could clarify, because you also mentioned about major and minor, and maybe oh, just... Oh, uh, okay, sorry. That, that's, so a ma at, at, at an American university, uh, people major in a discipline. And I, my understanding of, of the system in Spain is that many students come in and enter programs from their first year and have to kind of stay in those programs. But in the American system, that's particularly in the liberal arts and sciences or the general degrees, a Bachelor of Arts or Bachelor of Science, many students come in and say, I want to come to study uh, English. And then they declare, right, they say, I want to study English, and, and then they declare a major in English. And they might decide, okay, I then want to also minor in something. So they declare a minor in writing studies. But within that process, many students decide, but they, they, in their first year of college, they suddenly take a class in economics and say, I don't want to be a writing major anymore or an English major, and they change. And so the idea of majors is extremely important because that's the metric, the number, which administrators often use to say if a department is succeeding or not. If, so if you have a lot of majors, that's a growing department, that's an important department. If you have very few majors, that is showing to administrators, well, there's not that many people who want to take your major. So that's the one metric. The other metric which administrators use is how many students are actually in your classes. Right? So if you have a lot of bodies in your classes, they call that full-time equivalence, um, that's important as well, so that's other metric. But majors is essentially your currency. You want as many majors as you can get. And the argument that I was making is that very few students enter college in, the, in America saying, I want to be a geographer. They enter college saying, I want to be a biologist, or I want to be an engineer, or let's say I want to major in English or, or psychology. And then they have to take a class uh, which fulfills some requirement, and it might be a geography class. And then they say, Jesus, this is the best thing ever, and they change from engineering or English or economics to um, geography. But if they're not getting the opportunity to take those classes, then they're never going to change. And that's the point that I was making about um, advanced placement. If kids are coming in with all these advanced placements, they have less reason to take... A, a class, let's say, in geography, so they never get introduced to it, so you, you can't capture them. So that's the idea of majors. Majors are crucially important um, for programs because that's the number that, that administrators often use to see if you're going to cut. If you're going to cut a program, if you, if, you know, if you have 200 majors, they're less likely to cut you than if you have two. So that's, that's the, the point. All right. All right. Okay. So thank you so much. Um, also, one of the other points uh, that you mentioned I thought was very interesting was the need to not work against, but to work with, to try to find the synergies, not to understand that um, other departments could uh, take your students uh, from your own major or from your own specialty, but also the possibility and the big challenge also to work on this interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary approach. That probably is also one of the challenges right. that we need to face uh, in the future, and also one of the opportunities. Yeah, it can be both. It depends on how, how it's done. All right. So, well, uh, then, uh, if there is no more questions, um, thank you so much for, um, for your talk and for the 
all ideas that you brought to us and the understanding uh, that provide for the Americas uh, university system and specifically for the geography departments. And just a reminder, perdoneu, ara ho parlarem català, <laughs> si no m'he donat compte. Doncs, eh, lo que també volem recordar-vos a tots és que la propera conferència que es farà serà el 20 d'abril, eh, serà amb el professor Mike Meadows, que és el president de la Unió Geogràfica Internacional. Per tant, eh, serà a l'hora de sempre, a les 6.30, aquí a l'Institut d'Estudis Catalans i també doncs, amb la plataforma Zoom. Per tant, eh, doncs, us esperem de nou eh, per aquesta conferència conferència i de nou doncs donem les gràcies al professor Gransaf per les reflexions que ens ha portat avui. Molt bona tarda, bona nit a tothom. Gràcies. Thank you.